now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. We'll have drama on this Wednesday with an episode of Suspense from 1948, Mr. President from 1949, a Theater Royale episode from 1954, and an episode of Lum and Abner. And we thank you for tuning in on this Wednesday. This is the 27th day of March, 87th day of this leap year, 279 days remaining till we get to 2025. In 1513 on this date, Ponce de Leon sighted North America, specifically Florida, for the first time. He mistook it for another island. In 1794, the government of the U.S. established a permanent navy and authorized the building of six frigates in 1794. In 1834, Andrew Jackson censured by the Senate for his actions regarding the U.S. National Bank. In 1836, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana ordered the Mexican army army to kill about 400 Texans at Goliad, Texas. In 1958, Nikita Khrushchev became premier of the Soviet Union. The Good Friday earthquake struck on this date in 1964, the most powerful earthquake ever in the U.S. at a magnitude of 9.2. It struck south-central Alaska 125 people were killed and inflicting massive damage to the city of Anchorage. I want to warn you that some of this might be disturbing. That's the warning center calling all stations, calling all stations. Uh, again, we repeat, the entire port facility has just been wiped out. There is simply isn't a port there anymore. The quake has generated sea waves up to 30 to 35 feet at irregular time intervals. Is that correct? Desperately needed at Providence Hospital. Don't sit out in your car. Get undercover now. All structural and architectural engineers for the U.S. District of Army Engineers are to report to room 111, the District of Engineers building at Olinville. The area is a major disaster area. We received this report through the city manager here in Anchorage that both the oil tanks and docks are on fire at Seward. It seems as though... We were sending one of the characters in the Old Testament in the fiery furnace. I can just, uh, that just seems to me it was not said it. It's plaster, debris, fire, uh, and splinters, wooden chunks fell from the ceiling. We just felt that this was it. Only the 1960 Valdiva earthquake and tsunami was more powerful in Chile. That was estimated at between a 9.4 and a 9.6 magnitude, up to 6,000 people killed in that quake four years earlier. Actually, that was in May of uh, 1960. Uh, In 1968, Yuri Gagarin, Soviet cosmonaut, the first human in space, died in an aircraft training accident. In 1969, Mariner 7, the second half of the first dual flight to Mars, was launched. In 1970, the Concorde made its first supersonic flight. In 1993, Jing Shemin appointed President of the People's Republic of China. In 1995, the Academy Awards presented to Tom Hanks for his role of Forrest Gump. My mom always said life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. The movie also took the Best Picture Award and Robert Zemeckis won for Best Producer. In 1998, the Food and Drug Administration approved Viagra for use as a treatment for male impotence, the first pill to be awarded for this condition, approved for this condition, rather, in the United States. And in 2000, Kevin Spacey took the Best Actor Oscar honors at the Academy Awards. He dedicated his award to his mentor, Jack Lemmon. This is the highlight of my day. 
I hope it is not all downhill from here. Jack Lemmon would die the following year of cancer. Among those passing away on this date in history, we mentioned uh, Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. Also, Dudley Moore, the star of Arthur, a wonderful movie. Director Billy Wilder, journalist and author Irving R. Levine, best known for his time at NBC News. Also from Rope and Strangers on a Trade, Farley Granger passing away on this date. Mother Angelica, the Roman Catholic leader and media personality. And passing away on this date in 2002, Milton Berle. And now, ladies and gentlemen, introducing America's number one television star, Milton Berle! Burl's radio show was probably some of his best work. His show, I should say, he did several shows, but his uh, show that ran from 1947 until 1949 on radio uh, was some of his best work. The television show, of course, dealt with a lot of slapstick. Uncle Milty passing away on this date in 2002. Among those born on this date in history... Ferdy Grofay, the composer, his Grand Canyon suite is sublime. Also, Sunset Boulevard actress Gloria Swanson, born on this date. Actor Richard Denning, uh, born on this date. We know him here uh, for My Favorite Husband. Singer Sarah Vaughn. TV's The Fugitive, David Jansen, born on this date. And race car driver Cale Yarborough from Kansas. Born on this date in history, we lost him just this last year at the age of 84. Hi, this is Jeff Foxworthy. It is now time for the birthday announcements. The following people are now officially older than dirt. Director Quentin Tarantino is 61 today. Singer Mariah Carey, 55. From Lost, Elizabeth Mitchell is 54. From Castle, Nathan Fillion is 53. The Black Eyed Peas lead singer, Fergie, Stacey Ferguson, 49. And from The Social Network and Changeland, Brenda Song is 36. Those just a few of the people who celebrate the 27th day of March as their birthday. And if this is your birthday... Hi, we're the four freshmen, and we just want to say... Happy birthday to you. And we'll get started with the classic radio theater shows here in just a moment. Uh, We will begin with an episode of Suspense from 76 years ago, March 27th, 1948, The Night Must Fall, starring Robert Montgomery. That's up next here on this Wednesday, Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Home shelters can protect you from radioactive fallout. Are you prepared? Hey, Joe, you're causing a small riot in the neighborhood. What's going on over here? Well, finally got smart, huh? Right, this shelter's going to be finished, even if... Oh, even if I lose a couple of fingers doing it. Don't let that enthusiasm carry you too far, Joe. But getting that home shelter completed is mighty important to you and your family. Even if you live far from a target area, there's still a chance you may be subjected to radioactive fallout. Tests have shown that the best protection against fallout is an underground shelter covered with at least three feet of earth. A basement shelter will offer good protection if you close off all windows, exterior entrances, and bank exposed walls. In homes without basements, first floor areas with the least exterior exposure, such as bathroom, utility room, or hallways, should be selected. Remember, a strong defense begins with a prepared family and ends with a protected nation. Be prepared. Those shelter plans could be your blueprint for survival. Between the suspense sponsorships of Roma Wines and Autolite, Uh, There were a a period of time in which uh, almost, uh, what was four months, in which uh, there was no sponsor for suspense. And during that period, they experimented with hour-long episodes. Uh, 17 episodes were uh, an hour long. Uh, They ran from uh, January 3rd to, uh, uh, to May 1st, rather. Robert Montgomery was the host of the show. For the first time, the show had a real host, apart from the man in black. 
And uh, he served as producer of the show, and he performed in five of those shows. You'll hear one of those hour-long episodes coming up on this edition of Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Uh, This one is from uh, 76 years ago today, March 27, 1948. This episode is entitled, The Night Must Fall. Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills brings you an hour, a full 60 minutes of suspense. Tonight, a banner presentation of Emlyn Williams' classic, Night Must Fall, directed by Anton M. Leader and produced by Robert Montgomery. Our stars... Mr. Montgomery and Dame May Whitty with Heather Angel, Richard Ney, and Matthew Bolton in Night Must Fall. This is Robert Montgomery. I cannot introduce Night Must Fall. I I have no words in prologue. So surely do I feel that the play is the thing. But I can introduce with great anticipation and pride the performance of Dame May Whitty as Mrs. Bramson... Heather Angel as Olivia Grain, Richard Ney as Hubert Lowry, and Matthew Bolton as Inspector Belsize. It is our particular pride that both Dame May Whitty and Matthew Bolton are playing the roles they created in the original stage play in London. And I, I will play Danny. With these performances, and with Night Must Fall, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! It is a smallish place, a typical English country cottage, rambling and comfortable, with roses climbing upon the walls and the fences. Surrounding it on every side stands the dark bulk of the forest, the massive trees close-packed, their interlacing canopies shadowing the undergrowth below. It is an out-of-the-way place, far from the nearest village, a mile or more from the nearest neighbor, A proper place for a murder, you might say. Usually the forest quiet is undisturbed, but today one might hear a few scattered shouts, see strange men in uncomfortable city clothes poking about through the brush, searching. And in the Bramson cottage, Dora the maid is receiving a visitor in the kitchen. Oh, Danny, I'm so glad you come. I've been half off me rocker, what with that old witch in there saying all those terrible things about you and me, and the police turning the place upside down and asking all kinds of questions. And... Oh, Danny! Here, 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 steady now. What's all the row? What police? You mean you haven't heard? That Mrs. Chalfant, the woman from the tall boss, has disappeared. Nobody knows what's become of her. All that. And there's even a man from Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard? That is gratifying. Gratifying? Well, I mean, they're being Johnny on the spot like that. Shows we're getting our tax money's worth. Now, what's the matter with the old girl? Oh, Danny, she knows about us. And she says if you don't marry me, she'll... She'll give me the sack. <whistles> oh, Danny, you will. You will, won't you? If you no, don't... No, if about it. Always had the very same thing in mind myself. Oh, Danny. I expect she wants to talk to me. Where is it? Through this. Oh, you can't go in now. She's got people with her. The Scotland Yard well, I man. I can look, can't I? Well, Danny, be careful. She is you. Cat can look at a king, you know. So that's Mrs. Bramson, eh? They say she don't have half a bit talk tucked away. Oh, she's rich and all, but try to get hold of it. Who's the girl? With the spectacles. Oh, that's her niece, Miss Grine. Miss Olivia Grine. 
poor son. And the chap with her, I, I suppose he... Mr. Lorry. He wants to marry her, but... Aye. I don't think she wants to, not really. Well, now, if you see anything unusual, or anybody strange wandering in the woods, our men are stationed nearby, and just let them know. Good morning, Mrs. Bramson. Who's that? Just left. The detective. Scotland Yard. Wish I had a better look at him. Never seen anyone from Scotland Yard before. Dora? <laughs> That's your young man, I guess, talking about that. Uh -oh. No, Mum. That is, yes, Mum. Only. Well, send him in here instantly. Yes, Mum. Go on. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, as they say. Well? <coughs> Morning, all. So you're Babyface, as Dora calls you. That's me. Silly name, isn't it? What's your real name? Dan. Just call me Dan. You smoke, I see. Yes. Oh, I am sorry. I always forget my manners with a cigarette when I'm in company. I am sorry. You know my maid, Dora Parco, I believe. Oh, we haven't met, yes. You walked out with her last August bank holiday. Yes. <laughs> Excuse me smiling, but it, it sounds funny when you put it like that, doesn't it? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Oh, I am. I've thought about it a good bit since, I can tell you. You work at the Tall Boys, don't you? Yes, miss. 24 hours a day, miss. Oh, well, then perhaps you can tell us something about that female who's been murdered. Hmm? Well, can you tell us? <laughs> you know, there's a Mrs. Chalfont staying at the Talboys who went off one day. Yes. Well, nobody's seen her since. I know. What's she like? But I thought you said, or somebody said, something about a murder. <laughs> well, we don't know, of course, but there might have been, mightn't there? Oh, yes, there might have been, yes. Have you ever seen her? Oh, yes. I, I used to take cigarettes and drinks up to her. Well, what's she like? What's she like? She's on the tall side. Thin ankles with one of them bracelets on one of them. Fair hair and... Well, go on. Thin eyebrows with white marks where they was pulled out to be in the fashion, you know. Her mouth, a bit thin as well, with red stuff painted round it. You can rub it off, I suppose. Her neck, rather thick, laughs a bit loud, and then it stops. She's very lively. You can't say I don't keep my eyes skin, can you? Jove, I should say you do. A living portrait, if ever there was one. Now, uh... Weren't you going for a walk? <laughs> so I was, by Jove. Well, I'll just charge off. Goodbye. Goodbye, Hubert. You're a very observant, young man. Not the ladies, you know. If you weren't so observant... That Dora mightn't be in the flummock she is now. <laughs> That's true, ma'am. You don't sound very repentant. Well, what's done's done's my motto, isn't it? Or oh, you leaving, miss? If you don't mind. She'd be a nice bit of ice for next summer, wouldn't she? You're a proper one to talk about next summer, when Dora will be... Well, what is it now? Oh, uh, Mrs. Branson, the butcher wants paying, and he says there's men ferreting at the bottom of the garden looking for that Mrs. Chalfont, and do you know about it? Well, they won't ferret long. Not amongst my pampas grass. Olivia? Olivia! Oh, that girl's never there. Here, you. Come out of my garden, you. Come out. You there. You, you come out of my garden. <laughs> You're the cook, I suppose. Why, I'll never know. Won't let me pie the butcher so I won't know where she keeps her purse. But I do know. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. They do say down at the tall boys that she's got enough inside of her purse, too. Well, nobody's seen it open. If you have a peep inside, young fella, you'll go down in history. That's what you'll do. I... Oh, something's boiling over. Auntie, did you... Oh. Hello, miss. Did Mrs. Bramson call me, do you know? I'm sorry. I don't know your name. Oh. There is uh, not much doing around here for a girl, is there? I'm not a snob, but in case you ever call here again, I'd like to point out that though I'm employed by my aunt, I'm not quite in Dora's position. Oh, I hope not. Though I'll be putting it all right for Dora. I'm going to marry her, and I... I don't believe you. You don't like me, do you? No. Everybody else does? Your eyes are set quite wide apart. Your hands are quite good. I... I don't really know what's wrong with you. You know, I've been looking at you, too. You're lonely, aren't you? You know, I can I'm see... sorry. It's a waste of time you're doing your stuff with me. I'm not the type. Are you playing up to Mrs. Bramson? 
clean up? You stand a pretty poor chance there, you know. What do you bet? They say they've got permits to look for that silly woman. Who are they, I'd like to know? If there's anything I hate, it's these men who think they've got authority. I don't think they're quite as bad as men who think they've got charm. What do you mean by that? Well, it's no good thinking she's got any, is it? Now, young man, what about Dora? Uh, wait I... a minute, wait a minute. Are you sure you're comfortable like that? Yes, don't you think, what? Mrs. Bramson, yes. you ought to be facing a, a no, wee no, no. bit more this side? Yes. They are towards the sun more now. You're looking pale, you know. Pale? Did you say pale? Washed out. The minute I saw you just now, I said to myself, now there is a lady that's got a lot to contend oh, well, with. Well, I have. Nobody knows it better than I do. Oh, no, I'm sure. Oh, it must be terrible to watch everybody else striding up and down, enjoying everything, and to see everybody tasting the fruit, and... Oh, I am sorry. I shouldn't have ought to say that. But it's true. As true as you're my witness. Do you mind if I ask you what your ailments are? Oh, well, hadn't you better sit down? Thank you, ma'am. Well, I have the most terrible palpitations. Palpitations? I... But the way you get about... Oh? Well, it's a pretty bad thing to have, you know. Do you know that nine women out of ten in your position to be just sitting down and giving way? Would they? Yes, they would. I've known people with palpitations. Somebody very close to me. They're dead now. Oh. My mother, as a matter of fact. I can just remember her. Oh. As a matter of fact. Yes? Oh, no, it's a daft thing. Come along now, out with it. Well, it's only fancy, I suppose, but you remind me a bit of her. Of your mother? Oh. Have you got a son? I haven't anybody at all. She had the same eyes, very wide apart as you, and, 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 and the same very good hands. Oh. And the same palpitations. And the same palpitations. You don't mind my talking about your health, do you? No. You know, you ought to get used to letting other people do things for you. Yes. Yes. You're a funny boy to be a page boy. <laughs> I've taken a liking to you. That's very kind of you, Mrs. Bramson. Auntie, shall I pack these books for the post now? I'll post them for you. Oh. With pleasure. Have you got to go back? Now? Well, no, not really. This is my half day. Stay to lunch. Well, I, I don't like to impose myself. In the kitchen, of course. Oh, I know. Well, there's plenty of food. Stay to lunch. Well, I don't know. All right, so, so long as you let me help a bit this morning. Don't you want some string for this? Where's it kept? Oh, that woman knows. In the kitchen somewhere. Through here? Yes, that's right. Dan, what'd she say? Say? About us? Oh, it's all right. I told her I'm going to marry you. Oh, Dan! Here, here, here. Now, I'm on, I'm on an errand for the old girl. I, I want a bit of string. Oh, yes. Right here in the jar. An errand for Mrs. Bramps. That's right. Aha. Uh -huh. This'll do. Oh, Dan, she likes you. And why not? Here's something in the paper. A, a keeper in the Shepley Woods was closely questioned, but he had heard nothing beyond a woman's voice in the woods and a man's voice probably with her. Rubbish, the whole business. Uh, you, uh, Dan, or whatever your name is, are those men still rummaging in my garden? They're out there poking about right enough. And I must go this minute and have a look at my pampas grass. And if they've damaged it... I'll bring an action. <laughs> Have your package ready in half a shake now, miss. Thank you. What's that you're whistling? I don't know, some song I picked up. Mighty like a rose, I think they call it. Do you know what it says here in the paper? About what? The, the murder. Oh, you're sure of that now, are you? It says, a keeper heard a woman's voice in the woods on the afternoon in question, and a man's voice, probably with her, singing Mighty Like a Rose. Is that a fact now? Popular song, that one. Pretty, too. Pretty little fella. Everybody knows. Don't know what to call me, but I'm mighty like a rose. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, <laughs> ha,
I'm sorry. Is my cigarette worrying you? Not at all. I like it. I can never make this hurried game come out. Look. The red nine on the black ten. Don't interfere. I saw that. Now I wonder... No, 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 no. The other one, the other one, the other one. Oh, yes, dear, of course. (coughs) (coughs) Oh, I am sorry. My cigarette bothering you? No, dear, no. Oh, I'm sick of solitaire. I want to be read to. Right to we now. Let's see what we have. Ah. You old-fashioned child. What? It's East Lynn. It's your favorite book, isn't it? Oh, why, yes, dear, so it is. Go on. You old-fashioned child retorted Mrs. Vane. Why did you not put on your diamonds? I did put on my diamonds, stammered Lady Isabel. But I took them off again. What on earth for... That's the other lady speaking there. Yes, dear. What on earth for? I did not like to be too fine, answered Lady Isabel with a laugh. Good, isn't it? Oh, yes, realistic. Ah, time for your medicine. Oh, Danny, you always remember. Hello, 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 everyone. Any news? Hello, Hubert. News? About what? Why, about the... That is, the missing woman. What else? All I know is those idiot policemen are still pottering about in my garden and my pampas grass is practically ruined. They haven't found anything, of course. They never will. Lots of nonsense. Well... Where there's life, there's hope. What? Ah, uh-huh, Mrs. Bramson, time for your walk. Oh, yes, dear. Have you got my pills? Got them in my pocket. And my chocolates. Got them in my pocket, too. Here's your hat now, and I carry your rug on my shoulder. See you later. Be good. Right you are. Mind you take good care of her. Hubert. Yes? What do you think of them? Granny's white-haired boy, you mean? <laughs> He's all right, I suppose. He's made quite a hit with her. Yes, hasn't he? And in such a short time. Something I haven't been able to manage in a year. Yes. It was just two weeks ago today he moved in, bag and baggage. He came the afternoon after... that woman disappeared. By Jove, that's right. Hubert. Hmm? Have you noticed... how he acts as if he doesn't care tuppence, but all the time he's watching to see what we're thinking of him? Oh, yes, I've thought of that. It's his incredible vanity. They always have it. Who? Murderers. Good heavens, Olivia. Do you mean this woman they're looking for? Yes. But why? Oh, it's incredible. I say... Hubert, uh, I'm going to look through his things. Right now, will you? Oh, while they're out. I say, now, that's, that's a bit thick, spying. We may never have another chance. Please, will you help me? But, well, I suppose... Come on. <laughs> Wasn't there another one? Oh, yes. This hat box. Old-fashioned, isn't it? A bit heavy, too. Suppose there's something inside it. It's locked. Damn. But I've got the key somewhere about, if you... Oh, no, no, no. We were just... Could I have my wallet back, please? It's the only one I got. Oh, yes, of course. Thank you very much. Not at all. I... Did you see the picture of me when I was a little fella? Yes, it's very jolly. Did you? It was on the inside of my wallet. Oh, was it? Yes, where I should be keeping my money. Only any bit of money I have, I always keep on me. Safer, don't you think? Yes. I only keep one ten bob note in there at this wallet for for emergencies. Oh, that's funny. It's gone. Well, I expect I dropped it somewhere. What did you think of the letter? Letter? You got it in your hand. Oh, well, I didn't. It means well, does Lil, but we had a row. She would spy on me. And if there's anything I hate, it's a spy. Don't you agree? Yes. I'd sooner have anything than a spy. Bar a murderer, of course. What? What did you say? I said bar a murderer, of course. Talking of murder, do you know anything about Mrs. Chalfont's whereabouts at the moment? I've got nothing to go on, but I think she's been murdered. Oh, you do? Yes, I do. Who by? They say she had several chaps on a string, and there was one fella, a London chap, a bachelor, very cityfied, with a fair moustache. He... What are you looking at me for? Well, now, you wasn't around these parts the day she bunked, was you? Yes, I was, as a matter of fact. Uh-huh. What in heaven's name are you getting at? Well, if the shoe fits, eh? Uh, 
I'm going out for a breath of air, Olivia. <laughs> I'm sorry. I really am about going through your things. Sally, you were caught at it, you mean. Did you do it? You know, you wouldn't be bad looking without them glasses. It doesn't interest me very much what I look Don't like. Don't you believe it? You're very conceited, aren't you? Yes. And you're acting all the time, aren't you? Acting? Acting what? Look at the way I can look you in the eyes. I'll stare you out. I have a theory. It's the criminals who can look you in the eyes. And the honest people who blush and look away. Oh? It's a very blank look, though, isn't it? Is it? You are acting, aren't you? Yes. And what do you like when you're not acting? I don't know. It's so long since I stopped. But when you're alone... Then I act more than ever I do. Why? I don't know, because I like it. Okay? Now, what do you say if I ask a question or two for a change? Just for a change. Why can't you take a bit of an interest in some other body but me? I'm not interested in you. But you... You don't talk. That's bound to make people wonder. I can talk a lot sometimes. A drop of drink makes a power of difference to me. <laughs> You'll be surprised. I wonder if I would. I know you would. I think I can diagnose you all right. Carry on. You haven't any feelings at all, but you live in a world of your own. A world of your own imagination. I don't understand you so very well. Not being so very literary. You follow me perfectly well. Do you still think there's been a bit of dirty work? I don't know what to think now. I, I suppose not. Disappointed? What on earth do you mean? Disappointed? Yes, I suppose I am. Why? Oh, I don't know. Because nothing has ever happened to me. and It's a dull day and it's the depth of the country. I, I don't know. <coughs> Dora, what is it? Sticking in the rubbish bin. Well? There's something sticking out. What is it? A hand. Somebody's hand. Oh, Miss Gray, somebody's hand. Oh, they found her. Yes. Where are you going? To have a look. Tonight's full hour of suspense, Mr. Robert Montgomery stars as Danny, with Dame May Whitty, Richard Ney, Heather Angel, and Matthew Bolton in Night Must Fall. Tonight's study in Suspense. In just a moment, we will return with Act Two of Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And from 76 years ago today, March 27, 1948, Suspense, here on Classic Radio Theater. By the way, uh, it, people ask, why do you say today? Because these shows are released on specific days, these uh, podcasts. And today's is released on Wednesday, March 27, 2023. Four. So, you know, we're really using that as the date of release of the show. And it makes sense to me. I hope it does to you. Uh, we'll have the second half of Suspense following these important messages. Uh, I, I will tell you that on our next program, on our Thursday podcast, we will have a mixed bag of some nice shows, including X-1, Orson Welles and the Lives of Harry Lime, Jack Benny, Gangbusters, and The Adventures of Jungle Jim. That'll be coming up on Thursday. We'll get back to the conclusion of this episode of Suspense in just a moment. Survival in the nuclear age is your responsibility. Are you prepared? Okay, let's get this family meeting wound up and I'll treat all of you to a movie. Now, suppose I run down this list of family responsibilities during a disaster once more and make sure we all know just what to do. Now, let's see. It's Mother's job to stock the food and water supply in the shelter and keep it rotated. Junior, you check the battery-operated radio and take care of storing extra batteries. 
Susie, you keep the first aid kit fully supplied. Keeping the car in tip-top shape in case of evacuation will be my job. To protect your home and family, everyone must make a contribution. In the event of enemy attack or a sudden natural disaster, the speed with which you can swing into action may mean the difference between survival and collapse. But to be efficient, action must be organized. Assign a specific home preparedness job to each member of the family. Remember, a strong defense begins with a prepared family and ends with a protected nation. Start your family on a home preparedness program today. More information on civil defense at civildefensemuseum.org. Now on this Wednesday Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we continue with the conclusion of suspense from 76 years ago, March 27, 1948. And now, back to our Hollywood soundstage and Act Two of Night Must Fall. Starring Robert Montgomery, Dame May Whitty, Heather Angel, Richard Ney, and featuring Matthew Bolton in a narrative well calculated to keep you in suspense. The forest around Mrs. Bramson's cottage had always been quiet and peaceful until the day they found the body. From that day on, there was no more quiet. There were policemen and questions. There were busloads of sightseers and newspaper men and photographers. Suddenly, the little rose-covered cottage was a focus of national curiosity. And the people who lived there basked in the reflected glory. <laughs> oh, Danny, you are the one. <laughs> Back home again. I put oh, your gloves away. I feel dead. And no wonder talking to all those people, getting your picture took 15, 16 times again. <laughs> I hope not any more buses today. <laughs> oh, it's you, Olivia. Hello, Auntie. And Mr... Um, and Mrs. Uh, Bramson? I feel dead. Now, don't be a silly old woman. You look as pretty as a picture. Strawberries and cream in your face and not a day over 40. And when I've made you a nice cup of tea, you'll be 25 in the sun and 18 with your back to the light so you can think yourself lucky. <laughs> you, you caution. <laughs> you'll be the death of me. <laughs> <laughs> and now would you like a drop of in your tea? Gin, whiskey, liquor, brandy, or a nice dollop of sailor's oh, rum? Hey? Just listen to him. <laughs> now, don't you make me laugh, dear. Because, you know... There's always my heart. You've lost your heart. You know you have. To the little fellow who pushes your pram. You know you have. Pram! (laughs) (laughs) Pram! Uh Uh-huh. It's wicked to laugh, dear, with with this thing all around us. Ah, yes. I forgot. Wonder if they'll ever nab him. What do you mean? The fellow did it. Wonder what he's doing now. I wonder. You know, the fact they still have no idea where this woman's head is... Cut clean off? At one stroke, they say. Stop it. Well, no need to jump down the poor boy's throat. It's merely the fact. Cut off at one stroke. (sighs) Horrible. I suppose you won't stay to tea, Mr... Uh, uh... No, no, thank you. I think I'll go off before it's dark. Goodbye, Mrs. Bramson. Goodbye, Mr... Dan, Dan, just Dan. Goodbye, Olivia. Goodbye, Hubert. I'm sorry. Can't be helped. Good night. Good night, I'll see you to the door. Well, what's he so solemn about? Olivia's decided not to marry him. Silly girl. Made up her mind a bit sudden, didn't she? Oh, I don't know what's got into the girl. This last week or so, she's been touchy as a cat with kittens. Maybe she's lost her heart to someone too, eh? (laughs) Tell me. Tell me. Have any more of those terrible people called reporters, police? There's a definite falling off in attendance today. It's Sunday, I expect. <laughs> don't talk like that, dear. Sorry, Mum. And don't you call me Mum. Well, if I can't call you Mrs. Bramson, then I can't call you Mum. What can I call you? Well, if you're very good, I might let you call me Mother. <laughs> okay, Mother. <laughs> you are in a mood today. <laughs> I want to be read to now. Your servant, Mother of mine? What will you have now? Let's see. There's the Channings and Red Court Farm. No, I'm tired of them. Well, uh... Oh... What about the Bible? The Bible? Sunday, you know. Oh, well, all right, dear. Makes a nice change. Not that I don't often dip into it. I'm sure you do. Now, where'll I read? Oh, at random's nice, don't you think, dear? At random. 
Yes, I... Auntie, the paper boy's at the back door. He says your picture's in the news of the world again. Oh? He says he won't leave the paper until he's been paid. Says he hasn't been paid for a month. Hasn't been paid? Is he mad? Are you mad? Why don't you pay him? Because you don't give me the money to do it with. Well, I... Oh, well, wheel me over to that cupboard. Right you are. Auntie. Well, what? Well, don't, don't you think... I mean, wouldn't it... Danny? <laughs> Why, he knows where I keep my money, don't you, dear? Since you told me, of course. Of course. Well, now, here, here's the key. Aye. Wait till I get it from around my neck. Aye. Now, help me with it. Right you are, dear. There you are. Well, Olivia, what are you staring at? Isn't that rather a lot of money to have in the house? Put not your trust in banks, is my motto, and always will be. And so right, so right. But there's hundreds of pounds. It... Don't be a silly goose. Here, go and get the paper. Yes, Auntie. And hurry back. Now, lock the box up and put it back. There's a dear. Right. What were those sort of coloured folders? Looked like somebody's will or something. Oh, they're bonds and stocks. Nothing you'd understand about, dear. Oh? Where is that girl with the paper? Here you are, Auntie. Thank you, miss. I'll find the place for you. There you are, no mother of mine. Oh, look, whole page. Headlines and all. Oh, yes. The victim's past. Right. With another picture of me underneath. Ah. Oh. Taken at Tunbridge a year before the war, really. Oh. The bungalow of death. Fiendish murderer still at large. The enigma of the missing head. Oh, this print's too small. Shall I read it to you? Yes, dear, do. The, let's see now. Oh, yeah. The, the, The murderer committed the crime in the forest. He buried the body shallow in the open pit... Cunningly chancing it being filled, which it was the next day, the 11th, that was the day before I come here. So it was. The head was severed by a skilled person, possibly a butcher. The murderer... What's the matter? Can you hear something? I forgot it was Sunday. They're going to church in the villages. All got up in their Sunday best. With the prayer books. And the organ playing and the windows shining. Shining on holy things, because holy things isn't afraid of the daylight. And Danny, what... But all the time the daylight's moving over the floor, and by the end of the sermon, the air, and the church is turning grey. And people isn't able to think of holy things so much no more, only of the terrible things that's going on outside, that everybody's reading about in the papers, because they know that though it's still daylight, and everything's ordinary and quiet, today will be the same as all the other days, and come to an end, and it'll be night. (laughs) I forgot it was Sunday. Good gracious. What's come over you, Danny? I speechify like anything when I'm roused. I used to go to Sunday school, see, and the thoughts sort of pop into my head, like as if I was reading them off a book. (laughs) You should have been a preacher, you should. (laughs) Well, I want to lie down now. Anything you say, Mother of mine, anything. No, 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 you pushed me about enough for one day. You might try to cheer Olivia up a bit, though. For the look of her, she needs it. Only too happy to try, Mum. That is, if you'd like me to, Miss Olivia. You've been drinking, haven't you? You don't miss much, do you? No. I've had a drink, and I feel fine. You wouldn't like another dose of reading, would you? I prefer talking. Carry on? Asking questions. Carry on? Are you sure you were ever a sailor? Are you sure you weren't a butcher? Ah, talking's daft. Doing's the thing. You can talk, too. Ah, yes. Did you hear me just now? She's right, you know. I should have been a preacher. I remember when I was a kid, sitting in Sunday school, catching my mother's eye where she was sitting by the door, and she pointed to the pulpit and then to me, as if to say, that's the place for you. I never forgot that. I don't believe a word of it. Neither do I, but it sounds wonderful, doesn't it? I never saw my mum, and I never had a dad, and the first thing I remember is the Cardiff Ducks. And you're the first woman I ever told that to. So you can compliment yourself. Or the drink. I think it's the drink. You do live in your imagination, don't you? Yes. It's the only way to bear with the awful things you have to do. What awful things? Well, you... (laughs) I haven't had as much to drink as all that. (laughs) You haven't a very high opinion of women, have you? Women don't have to drink, be drunk to talk. You don't talk that much, though. 
Fair play. You're a dark horse, you are. You know, this isn't the life for you. What is there to it? Tell me that. What is there to it? Yes. Getting up at seven, having breakfast with a vixenish old woman and spending the rest of the day with her in a dreary house in the middle of a wood. Going to bed at eleven. I'm plain. I haven't got any money. I'm shy. And I haven't got any friends. Don't you like the old lady? I could kill her. Oh, no, you couldn't. Not many people have it in them to kill people. Oh, no. And what was your life at the tall boys? My life? Well, the day didn't start so good. With a lot of stuck-up boots to clean and a lot of silly high heels all along the passage waiting for a polish. Orders, orders, orders. Go here, do this, do that. Open the door for me, get a move on. Waiter, my tea stone cold. I'm not a waiter. I'm a millionaire. And everybody's under me. And just when I think I got a bit of peace, there's somebody locking the bedroom door, won't let me out. Talk, talk, talk. Won't fork out with no more money. At me, at me, at me. Calls me everything. Lies on the floor and screams and screams. And nothing keeps that mouth shut, only... It's raining out of the window, and the leaves is off the trees. Oh, Lord, I wish I could hear a bit of music. And I do, inside of myself. And I have a drop of drink, and everything's fine. And when it's the night... Go on. <laughs> I do fly floor for you, aren't I? You'd like to know, wouldn't you? Why would you like to know? Why do you lie awake nights? Don't... I'm frightened of Why? you. Why? How do you know I lie awake at night? Shall I tell you why? Because you're awake yourself. You can't sleep, can you? You can't sleep. There's one thing that keeps you awake, isn't there? One thing you've pushed into the back of your mind, and you can't do any more about it, and you never will. And you know what it is? It's a little thing. A box. Only a box, but it's rather heavy. It's the only thing that keeps me awake, mind you. The only thing. But I don't know what to do. You see, nothing worries me. Nothing in the world. Only I don't like a pair of eyes staring at me with no look in them. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Dan. Oh, Danny. <laughs> don't. There's someone at the door. All right. Anybody's there, I'll deal with them. I'll manage them myself. You watch. Oh, hello, Dan. How's things? Not so bad, Mr. Inspector. Good afternoon, Miss Graham. How do you do? If you'll uh, excuse me, I'll... Of course. Are well, you bearing up, eh, Dan? Yes, sir. Bearing up, you know. We haven't scared you all out of the house yet, I see. Oh, no fear, sir. No more news from me, I suppose. No, sir. Ah, too bad, too bad. You mind if I sit down? Please do, sir. Would you like to see Mrs. Bramson, sir? Oh, plenty of time for that. How's she bearing up? Well, it's been a bit of a shock for her. Them finding the remains of the lady at the bottom of the garden, you know. Why didn't you sleep in your bed on the night of the 10th? What did you say? Why didn't you sleep in your bed on the night of the murder? I did. Oh, no, you didn't. Yes, I did. Oh, 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 for except about half an hour, that's right. I couldn't sleep for a taffy and I went up on the fire escape and I... Oh, what time was that? Oh, about... I, 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 oh, you know how it is when you wake up in the middle of the night, you don't know what time it is. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you tell us you were on intimate terms with the deceased woman? Intimate terms? Now, come along, old chap. She was seen by two of the maids talking to you in the shrubbery. Well? Oh, sir, it's been on my conscience ever since. So you were, eh? Oh, no, sir, not that. I avoided her ever after the day she stopped me, sir. When they asked me about her, I got frightened to tell about her stopping me. But now you know about it, sir. It's a, it's a weight off my mind you wouldn't believe. As a matter of fact, sir, it was the disgust like of nearly getting mixed up with her that was keeping me awake at nights. I see. <laughs> You're a bit of a milksop, aren't you? Am I, sir? Yes. Well, that'll be all for today. I'll let you off just this once. I'm that relieved, sir. But don't... Oh, there's just one thing... If you don't mind, I'll have a quick look through your luggage. Just a matter of form. Oh, yes. Well, where do you hang out? Right in there, sir. First door facing. First door facing. You can't miss it. I'll find it. It's open, I think. You can't miss it. You can't miss it. You can't miss it. You can't miss it. This hat box is locked. Have you got the key? 
It isn't mine. Not yours? No. Whose is it, then? I don't know. It isn't mine. Oh, I... I'm sorry, I thought... Why, Inspector, what are you doing with my box? Your box? Yes. It's uh, got all my letters in it. But I found it... Oh, Dan's room used to be the box room. Oh, I see. I'll keep it in my wardrobe. It'll be safer there. If you'll give it to me, please. Of course. Uh, Thank you. I'm very sorry, Miss. I... uh, I'm afraid I've offended her. She'll be all right, sir. Well, young fellow, I must be off. You might tell the old lady I popped in, will you? Tell her I hope she's better. Thank you, sir. Good day, sir. Good day. Good day, sir. Good. Welcome back to the land of the living. Oh, Danny. We thought the murderer had got you. Whatever come over you? I I don't know. I felt sick, I think. Waiting hand and foot on Madame Crocodile. Enough to wear King Kong out. Here, have a sip of this. Thank you. Is that better? Yes. It clears the brain no end. Fainting indeed is the proper girl's trick. I'm ashamed of myself. Where's Miss Olivia? Gone somewhere for the night. Gone? For the night? Said she was frightened. Just a good excuse to get away from the old dragon, if you ask me. Did she say why she was frightened? Not her. Not Miss High and Mighty. I've got my own ideas about where she was going. Let Mr. Hubert... Oh, never you mind about her and Mr. Hubert. Maybe the poor thing was frightened. She tried to get the old lady to leave with her, didn't she? Well, not that she'd ever budge. Oh, we've got to get on if we're to get through the woods before it's too dark. Well, come along, then. I'd come with you, only I'm going the other direction. Paley Hill way. You going out? Huh? Yes, I, I feel a bit funny. But you can't leave her here by herself. Oh, no, she'll scream the place down. I asked her a while back and she didn't seem to mind. You know what she is. She said, do me good and won't hear of me staying. It's no good arguing with her. No good arguing with her, don't I know it? <laughs> you have a nice long walk while you get the chance. You wait on her too much. Well, you better draw the curtains. Whew, ain't it dark out? You got the torch, Dora? Okay, honey. Good night, Dan. If you aren't coming our way. See you in the morning. Good night. Okay. Toodaloo. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night here, good night there. Anyone who thinks the night before Judgment Day. What's the matter with... Talking to myself... Wish people wouldn't walk out of rooms and leave me high and dry. Don't like it. Well, my chocolates. That girl's been at them again. What's that? Oh, Lord. Danny. Danny. Hoy. Hoy. It must have been an owl. Oh, thank heaven. Danny, what's that boy doing in the kitchen? Danny, I've got the jitters. I've got the jitters. I've got the jitters, Danny. They've gone. They've all gone. They've left me here alone. Oh, Lord, help a poor old woman. Danny. Danny, where are you? Danny! Danny, I... I'm going to be murdered. Danny! 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 There's something outside. What shall I do? Danny! Danny! Danny, where are you? Where are you? Danny! 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 There's something outside. Oh, Lord, help me. 
Help me. Help me, O oh Lord. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. Danny! Oh! It's all right. It's only Danny. It's only Danny. Oh, 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 oh Danny, Danny, I, I'll never forgive you. Never. Oh, 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 oh
Danny. Danny! some proper use. Kerosene, 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 kerosene. Now, now, now we'll have a proper bonfire. I've never seen a dead body before. I climbed through the window. Nearly fell over it. Like a sack of potatoes or something. I thought it was at first. That's murder. But it's so ordinary. I, I came back expecting... I don't know. And here I find you smoking a cigarette. You, you might have been tidying up the room for the night. It's... It's so ordinary. Why don't you say something? I thought she was going to spend the night in town. I was. Why'd you come back? To find you out. You've kept me guessing for a fortnight, guessing hard. I very nearly knew all the time, but not quite. And now I do know. Why are you so keen on finding me out? In the same way any sane, decent-minded human being would want... We'd want to have you arrested for the monster that you are. Why did you come back? I... I told you. Ha! She didn't keep any money anywhere else, did she? I've read a lot about evil. I never expected to come across it in real life. You shouldn't read so much. I never got through a book yet. But I'll read you, all right. You haven't had a drop to drink, and yet you feel as if you had. You never knew there was such a secret part inside of you. I hate you. I hate you. feel you. as light as air, same as I feel sometimes. Why? This is my big chance. You're the one I can tell about myself. Oh, I'm sick of hearing how clever everybody else is. I want to tell them how clever I am for a change. Money I've got to have and people doing what they're told and me telling them what to do it. There was a woman at the tall boys, wasn't there? She wouldn't be told, would she? She never knew it was me she was dealing with. Me? Because I made her think... She was a chronically invalid, this old girl who's been treating me like a son. She's been more used to me tonight than she's been to any other body in her whole life. Stupid. That's what people are. Stupid. You said just now, murder's ordinary. Well, it isn't ordinary at all, see. And I'm not an ordinary chap. There's one big difference between me and the other fellows that tried this game. I'll never be found out. Because I don't care that. The world's got to be here from me. That's me. You wait. But you can't wait, can you? What do you mean? Well, when I say I'll never be found out, what I mean is no living soul will ever be able to tell any other living soul about me. Can you think of anybody who can go tomorrow and tell the police the fire at Forest Corner wasn't an accident at all? I... I can. No, you can't. Why can't I? Well, I'm up against a very serious problem, I am. But the answer to it is simple as pie to a fellow like me. Simple as pie. She isn't going to be the only one found tomorrow in the fire at Forest Corner. Aren't you frightened? You ought to be. Don't you think I'll do it? I know you will. I just can't realize it. You know, when I told you all about myself just now, I made up my mind then about you. That's what I am, see. I make up my mind to do a thing, and I do it. I... 
What's that light in there? What light? There's something in this room holding a flashlight. It can't be in this room. It must be a light in the wood. Well, it can't be. Look, there, the window. Somebody's watching the bungalow. Nobody's watching. I'm the one that watches. They got no call to watch me. I'll go out and tell them that and all. I'm the one who watches. Look, behind them trees. Hundreds of eyes back of each tree. Thousands of eyes. The whole world's on the track. What's that? What's that noise? Like a big wall falling over into the sea. They mustn't come in. You're looking at me as if you'd never seen me before. I never have. Nobody has. You've stopped acting at last. You're real. Frightened. Like a child. They mustn't come in. Everything's slipping away. From underneath our feet. Can't you feel it? Starting slow and then hundreds of miles an hour. I'm going backwards. And there's a wind in my ears, a terrible blowing wind. Everything's going past me like telegraph poles. All the things I've ever seen, faster and faster, backwards to the day I was born. I can see it coming the day I was born. I'm going to die. It's all right. You won't die. I'll tell them... I'll tell them I made you do it. I'll, I'll tell lies. I'll tell... Good evening. I'm sorry to pop back like this. Well, everything looks all right here. I tell you, we did hear her. Plain as plain. And we'd gone near a quarter of a mile. Plain as plain? You made my blood run cold. Danny, she screamed. Danny, where are you? Well, we'll soon find out. Now then... Oh, hello, Dan. Hello, sir. Second time today, eh? That's right, sir. How's the old lady? Oh, not so bad, thanks, Inspector. She's gone to bed. She says she didn't want to be disturbed. Smell of kerosene. Well, you know what she's like, Inspector. Very nervy these days. I'll just take a look in the bedroom, if you don't mind. I don't sooner got around the corner than she screamed for me. Danny, 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 she screamed. Danny, she calls me. That's a pet name for Dan, that is. I... She's not there. I... I'll take a look in the sunroom. Yeah. I told her so then. I said, it's dangerous. That's what it is. Having so much kerosene in the house. That kerosene. She shouldn't have had so much kerosene in the house. Well, now... Miss Crane, what are you doing here, may I ask? Inspector, I'm concerned It's all right. In... I'm the fella. Anything I'm concerned in, I run all by myself. If there's going to be any questions on a public platform to answer, I'm going to do it by myself. Or not at all. I'll manage myself all right. I get you. You're like a bit of limelight, eh? Well? Well, let's have a look at your hands, old boy, will you? Sure. Handcuffs. 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 That's better. You'd better come along quietly. Look at him. What's he doing? He's looking at himself. In the mirror. This is the real thing, my boy. Acting. That's what she said, wasn't it? She was right, you know. I've been playing up to you, haven't I? I showed you a trick or two, didn't I? But this is the real thing. Come along now. Just come in. Do you have a cigarette? Sure. You know, it's a funny thing. I want something now I've never wanted before in my whole life. A long walk. All by myself. Contrary, isn't it? You coming? But they'll get their money's worth at the trial. I'll hang in the end. They'll get their money's worth at the trial. You wait. You just wait and see. The 
this is Robert Montgomery again, with very grateful thanks to you, Dame May Whitty, Heather Angel, Richard Ney, and Matthew Bolton, for your superb performances in Night Must Fall. We all count your appearances here a distinct compliment. It was, of course, a great personal thrill to join you for tonight's play. Good night and thank you. Mr. Montgomery may soon be seen in the Universal International production, The Saxon Charm. Dame May Whitty's current picture is Columbia's Sign of the Ram. Heather Angel may soon be seen in Universal International's The Saxon Charm. Richard Ney's next picture is Joan of Lorraine. Night Must Fall by Emmeline Williams was adapted from the stage play by Robert L. Richards, was directed by Anton M. Leader, and produced by Robert Montgomery. Lud Gluskin is our musical director and conductor, and Lucian Morrowack composes the original scores. Next week, hear Dorothy Sayers' Suspicion on radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Suspense! sure to hear the new Shorty Bell Show, starring Mickey Rooney, tomorrow Sunday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From 76 years ago, March 27, 1948, Suspense on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Coming up next, Edward Arnold as Mr. President. First aid training may someday mean the difference between life and death. Are you prepared? Mmm, something smells mighty good. Dinner about ready? Almost. Oh, Jim, would you get that big salad bowl for me? It's up on the top shelf, way back in the corner. Sure, just a second, honey. Boy, it's really way back here in the corner. Jim! Jim! Are you all right? Yeah, I think so. Except my arm. Looks like a bad cut, Jim. Lie still. I'll get some towels and try to stop the bleeding. Thank heavens for my first aid training. During a national emergency or even a natural disaster, medically trained personnel might not be able to reach you. That's why it's important that at least one member of every family have first aid training. Even in your daily living, a knowledge of first aid will prove helpful, and during a national emergency, it will be invaluable. Remember, a strong defense begins with a prepared family and ends with a protected nation. Start your first aid course today for survival tomorrow. Now on this Wednesday Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we're going to present an interesting program. Mr. President was a series of programs that aired in the late 40s over NBC, uh, ABC, rather, and it bear an interesting premise. The stories all rotated around one of our uh, executive officers of the United States, a president, and all of the programs dealt with real-life situations, although many of the dialogue uh, was uh, imagined, shall we say. But the interesting part of the program is during the base of the program, listen until the last two or three minutes of the program, that you learned which president was specifically being referred to. So let's listen to this program from 75 years ago, March 27, 1949, one of the series, Mr. President, starring Edward Arnold as Mr. President. 
It's a funny thing for a man to be running for president with all the politicians against him. Mr. President, starring Metro Golden Mayor's Edward Arnold. Mr. President, at home in the White House, the elected leader of our people, our fellow citizen and neighbor, these are little-known stories of the men who lived in the White House, dramatic, exciting events in their lives that you and I so rarely hear, true human stories of Mr. President. Before we bring you Edward Arnold as Mr. President, a word or two. Rarely before in the history of our country has the office of the presidency been of such vital importance as it is today. As you know, the Constitution is very specific about the powers and duties of the president, making him somewhat subject to the will of the Congress in domestic matters, but almost entirely on his own in our dealings with other nations. Our foreign relations are vital to every one of us, and the president is our personal representative in such matters. Into this important picture enter the Mr. President's stories, telling in warm human terms of the adventures, the troubles, and the joys of the men who have been holding the highest office in the nation. You, our listeners, have the added thrill of testing your historical knowledge when you try to identify the president of each story. Test your knowledge now by listening to Mr. President. And now, in just a moment, Edward Arnold. story starts when the president was elected but not yet inaugurated. Listen closely and see if you know which president this happened to. It was late in the afternoon and the president had had a hard day and it seemed as though it was never going to end. Now then, Mr. President, if you will consider the merits of this man for Parkersburg, he has a shining record of service to his party. How about service to his country? <laughs> oh, you're not going to catch me, Mr. President. The man who serves his party well serves his country best. Now then, suppose we consider the record of this man. He did a lot of work for us in the election. You do owe men like that something, Mr. President. I think it's a matter of record, Mr. Lamb, that all the politicians were against me in the last election. I don't feel that I owe them anything. Well, now, somebody elected you, Mr. President. Oh, yes, indeed, somebody did. The people elected me. The people? Yes, you've heard of the people, haven't you, Mr. Lamb? Which people? The American people. Uh, Mr. Lamb, I think the president's a little tired. I'll say I'm tired. I'm tired of the attitude of politicians like you who start saying, gimme, gimme, gimme. Before a man's even in office. I'll, uh, I'll come back tomorrow. Good night, sir. Good night, Bissell. See you tomorrow. Good night. Mm. You, uh, don't want to look over any of this mail before you go home, do you? Well, if I don't, I won't even be able to see my desk tomorrow. Oh. Better close the windows. There's a storm on the way. It's going to snow. Hmm? Huh? How do you know? Papers say so? No, my corn says so. Oh. I see. Oh, well, listen to this letter, will you? I was injured while celebrating your election. I will appreciate it if you will send me $1,000 as compensation. Because you, if you hadn't been elected, I wouldn't have been celebrating. And if I hadn't been celebrating, I wouldn't have had any whiskey. And if I hadn't had any whiskey, I wouldn't have been hurt. Ah, below is the address where you can send the money. <laughs> Well, that's a nice kind of logic, isn't it? Yes, it's a big responsibility being president. A man suddenly has a hundred million children. Yes, you're the head of a mighty big family, Mr. President. Well, maybe I had better let the mail go until tomorrow. I'm going home. I'll see you at the meeting tonight. As baby. Oh, you never saw anything like her in your life. She talk yet? Can she talk? She's over a year old. <laughs> she can recite the Constitution from beginning to end. <laughs> I bet she can. <laughs> Here, let me help you with the coat. Uh, and another thing. She isn't always trying to get a job for somebody. <laughs> Oh, here you are at last, darling. Mm. Oh, what a cold.
cold kiss. Yeah, I kept it on ice for you. <laughs> you know, that storm outside is a humdinger all right. Uh-huh. Huh? Come on in in front of the fire. Yeah, uh, that feels better. I baked a pie for dinner. What kind? Lemon meringue. Oh, the same kind you baked the night you got me? Oh, I got you. Yes. Now, see here, my good fellow, you got me. Oh, nonsense, nonsense. You set your cap for me the first time you saw me. And to your everlasting credit, you got me. <laughs> You're right. And you know what it was that made me fall in love with you, Mr. Preston? Why, of course. I was handsome. I was brilliant. I was charming. No, it wasn't any of those things. It was your modesty. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so peaceful here. Ah, I, I think here at home with you and Ruth is the only place I'm safe from the office seekers right now. Oh, that reminds me. Speaking of Ruth, a letter came for her today. A letter for Ruth? My daughter? Mm -hmm. Here it is. She asked me to give it to you to read. Oh, let me see it. Let me see it. Uh, my dear Ruth, I belong to the Mugwumps, and one of the most sacred rules of our order prevents us from asking favors of officials or recommending men to office. But there is no harm in writing a friendly letter to you. Oh, for heaven's sake, this is, this is really going too far. Even a one-year-old child isn't safe. Go on, finish. Hmm? A friendly letter to you and telling you that an infernal outrage is about to be committed by your father in turning out of office the best consul I know, Captain Mason, Consul General of Frankfurt, just because he is a member of the party last in office, and now a member of your father's party wants his place. Huh. Oh, well, I'll send this through the regular channels tomorrow morning. Uh, now skip to the end. Uh -huh. I can't send any message to the president, but the next time you have a talk with him concerning such matters, I wish you would tell him about Captain Mason and what I think of a government that so treats its efficient officials. Signed... Signed, Mark Twain. <laughs> it's a nice letter, isn't it? Yes, hand me that pencil and pad, will you, my dear? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to write an answer for Ruth saying that she took the liberty of reading Mr. Twain's letter to the president and that he desires her to thank Mr. Twain for his information and to say to him that Captain Mason will be... will not be disturbed in the Frankfurt Consulate. Good. You like that, huh? I like it. But the members of your party won't. Oh, well, you have to make an exception once in a while to keep a good man in office, even if he is one the other thought was good, too. Oh, come on, let's let's have that stew at 8 o'clock, huh? And soon, because Daniel has to go into the lion's den tonight. Now, see here, Mr. President, you have a responsibility to your party, whether you like it or not. I also have a responsibility to the people, Congressman Jones. There are plenty of members of your own party fully qualified to hold that office in Frankfurt. I'm not going to take a good man off a job. Maybe you should have been run for office by the other party. You want them to hold all the jobs. I want the best man for the job. I don't care what his party is. Well, it's time you started caring. Now, see here, I'm the president of the United States. Yes, and you're representing a political party, a fact you find remarkably easy to forget. You seem to forget I'm also representing a country. Gentlemen, gentlemen. I'm sorry, Jones. I lost my head. I'm sorry, too, sir. Uh, may I say a word, Mr. President? Yes, of course, Wilson. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. President... The party system has its drawbacks as well as its merits. Now, precedents have been set. We're expected to follow them. We don't give out the usual political jobs. We weaken the structure of our own party. Now, we can't leave members of the opposition in any key positions. We'd look like fools. And besides, so... we've made certain promises and we have to keep them. All right, all right, I give up. Make your appointments. I'll keep out of the political appointments as much as possible. But that man stays in Frankfurt. But the man in Frankfurt is a member of the opposition. He's a good man and he stays. All right, Mr. President. I'm sure that everyone will be agreeable to him staying as long as they know this will be the last appointment of this nature. I really can't understand or imagine why anyone ever wants to be a president. You can't do anything. Mr. President, do we have your word that you will keep all future appointments yes, within... Yes, 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 yes. 
I'll keep all future appointments within the party. And now, if it's all right with the party, I think I'll go home and go to bed. <laughs> President? No, oh, who's that? John Wise. Oh, oh, you. How are you, John? I couldn't see you very well through the storm. Well, I thought that perhaps you weren't speaking to members of the opposition party. No, oh, no, don't you start on me. I've had a very hard day. <laughs> well, it never occurred to me that you'd still be riding the elevator. Why? Does your party own it? <laughs> no. No, nothing like that. You've been hunting lately? I have two fine new dogs. No, I haven't done any hunting. Everybody's been hunting me. <laughs> Well, here we are. Lots of seats this late. No, oh, thank heaven. Our Francis and the baby? Oh, they're fine. I hope their old man holds out. Oh, what's the matter? Oh, nothing but politics, politics. Say, I've been hoping for a chance to talk to you privately. I uh, wanted to speak to you about a man. Not a man and a job. Well, it amounts to that, yes. Oh, not you too, John. Well, this is a most unusual case, or I wouldn't consider presuming on our friendship. It concerns the postmaster of Walkerton, Virginia. I got him his appointment. I'm sorry, John, but a matter like that is out of my hands. I promise tonight to keep all future appointments within the party. This man is a deaf mute, Mr. President. A deaf mute? Yeah. And a job like he has now is one of the few jobs in the world that he can perform, and perform well. When he got the appointment, it... Well, it opened a whole new world to him. It, it gave him something to be interested in, something to live for. I see. He is a member of your party, of course. Well, not a very active one. Well, what's his name? J. Marshall Turner. Uh, Turner of Walkington, Virginia. That's right. I see. John, uh, Wilson Bissell is going to be the postmaster general. You talk to him about this right after the inauguration. If he won't help you, come to me and I'll see what I can do. In fact, I'll see what I can do anyhow. See, now, where was I? Oh, yes, 10, 11, 12. Uh, those are all the bags, I think. Oh, here's another two. Uh, where's your inauguration address? In my coat pocket. Uh, the men came for the trunks. Uh, the baby's things are in that bag. Uh, Francis, you and Maxwell get along pretty well, don't you? Oh, of course, dear. Why? Well, uh, Maxwell is handling a lot of the detailed work in the post office department for Bissell. I want to put a bee in his bonnet, but because of the nature of it, I can't do it personally. Now, what are you up to? Well, there's a postmaster in Walkerton, Virginia. How nice. Yes. He's a, he's a member of the other party. I knew you were up to something. Now, uh, I am, of course, confident that if the members of my party knew this man's story, they would insist that he be kept in office. But just to be on the safe side, I'd feel better if his papers were lost for the time being. You want his papers lost? Well, misplaced. Uh, I don't want the matter to come to anyone's attention for a while. You know, sometimes I think you're seeing a little too much of those boys down at headquarters. <laughs> I am, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, will you put the bee in Maxwell's bonnet? Uh, he's to hunt for the papers of the postmaster of Walkerton, Virginia. Right. He's to find them, and then he's to lose them. That's the idea. And why are you taking such an interest in the postmaster from Walkerton? Well, I've always liked the Bible story about the sparrow's fall, my dear. The sparrow's fall? Yes. The postmaster is deaf and dumb. Oh. And he, above all people, should be protected by the President of the United States. I'm going to keep him in office by fair means or foul. By hook or by... Crook. Yes, by golly, by hook or by any crook I have to use. In just a moment, we'll come back to Edward Arnold and Mr. President. Have you heard of the Red Cross's $60 million bargain? Perhaps $60 million doesn't appear to be a bargain, but it is when you realize what the Red Cross does with this money. The sum it will need in 49 for its tremendous day-to-day -day job. For example, when disaster strikes, the Red Cross goes into action at once to aid victims. 
And after the emergency is over, the Red Cross continues with rehabilitation work. Then there's the new Red Cross National Blood Program, with the aim of helping to save lives and prevent needless suffering. All blood and blood products are furnished without charge. Veterans can remember the Red Cross's services to the armed forces. This work still goes on. For all this, the Red Cross needs $60 million, a bargain in any language. So, give to the Red Cross. You can help through your Red Cross. Now back to Edward Arnold and Mr. President. Have you guessed who the president was who was having such trouble with the offer seekers? Listen closely and we'll continue the story in Washington. Once he was in office, the days were even busier. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please. I tell you, I've got to see the president right away. My time is valuable. I can't wait here all day. The president is in conference. Uh, why don't you come back tomorrow? Madam, I swung 17 precincts to the president. I think I'm entitled to a little more consideration than I'm getting. You think you'll be much longer, Francis? I have the entire list of postmaster appointments for him to look over. I hope not, Billy, but I don't know how he's going to manage with all he has to do today. He can't see everyone. This is supposed to be his afternoon for appointments. Mine was for 3 o'clock. It's already 3.30. Would you just give him this list of appointments, Francis, and I'll get in touch with him later. I'd be glad to, Billy. I'll drop by this evening. Hello, Francis. John. How nice to see you. Well, I uh, feel a little like a fish in the wrong fishbowl, but I must see the president. <laughs> you suppose he has a moment? Do you see all these people? Well, I knew that he'd be pretty busy, but this is a very important matter, Francis. Oh, does it concern the postmaster of Walkerton, Virginia? It does, indeed. The president tell you? Mum's the word, mate. All right, matey. <laughs> The president's in a very important conference, but I'll see if I can get to him. I'd appreciate that. Uh, wait here, John. Now, look at the advantages of this pedal, Mr. President. Darling, there's a mob waiting. They're getting very impatient. And John Wise... Uh, in a moment, Francis, in a moment. Uh, this is important. Uh, you were saying about the pedal. Well, you can press this pedal and it becomes a brake. Uh-huh. Now, no matter how hard you push against the carriage, you can't move it. Oh, say, that's pretty good. This is the most advanced baby carriage on the market, Mr. President. Well, uh, do you like it, Francis? Uh, yes, I, I think it's very nice, but uh, all those people out there, dear, and John... My, my wife has one of these carriages for our youngster, and she wouldn't be without it. Oh? Uh -huh. How old is your child? A year. Hmm. Girl? Oh, yes, indeed. The prettiest little lady in the world. Is that so? She has curls down to here. Oh, uh, really? Well, mine has curls down to here. <laughs> Down to her feet. Down to her feet. At a year old? Well, she had it when she was six months old. How tall is your child? Two feet. How tall is yours? Two feet. Two inches. <laughs> well, mine may be that tall by now. I haven't seen her since this morning. <laughs> what does your child weigh? Twenty-five pounds. Oh, mine weighs thirty pounds. A little overweight, isn't she? <laughs> The doctor says she's perfect for her age. Oh, well, that's funny. So does mine. You suppose you have a good man? The best. Does she cry much? <laughs> oh, never. She never cries. <clears throat> that your kid? Uh, of course not. That must be some baby visiting in the White House. Darling, I really hate to interrupt this important discussion, but there's so many people waiting. All right, Francis, all right. I'll take the carriage. My secretary will give you a check as you go out. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Good day, sir, uh, Madam President. Uh, goodbye. Nice to see you. Oh, uh, Mr. President. Yes? Do you use the rectangular fold or the triangle? Well, I like the old-fashioned way myself. That's what we use on ours, too. So your baby's right in style, Mr. President. Uh, goodbye, sir. Goodbye, goodbye. You know, I don't know why some fathers are so unpleasant about their children. You would think no one ever had a baby but that man. Yes, Mr. Preston. Mm. Do you think I should go to see if that was Ruth crying? Oh, that's Ruth, all right. Oh. But the nurse is with her, dear. Shall I send Mr. Wise in? Hmm? Oh, is, is John Wise here? Why, you, why, why didn't you say so, my dear? Never mind. It's too long a story. I'll send him in. Well, come in. Oh, 
come in, John. Come on in. I'm sorry to take up your time, Mr. President. I know how busy you are. How's the baby? Well, I'm not like most fathers go around bragging about their children. But she really is an exceptional child. Ah, I'm sure she is. <laughs> what brings you to Washington today, John? Well, I received this paper from Richmond yesterday. It's um, self-explanatory. Hey, look at the headline. Hmm. Bounced at last, wisest man must go. Congressman Jones triumphs after a hard fight. What's this all about, John? Well, that's about our friend, the postmaster at Walkerton. He's out of office? Mm-hmm. I see. I thought his papers were lost. Well, if they were, they've been found again. I'd hope this matter might not come up for a while. Did you see Bissell about it? Yes, I did. What did he say? Well, he said he was familiar with the case, but that Congressman Jones insisted on putting a party man in the office, and there was nothing that he could do. I see. Have you signed the uh, commission for the new postmaster? No, no. Well, then there's still time. John, let me think this matter over, will you? You see, there's been so much ill feeling over the appointments I have already made outside the party that I'm quite... Well, on a spot. I can't ignore my party completely, and I did give my word. Oh, I appreciate your position, Mr. President. Uh, come over in the morning about ten, John. Will Thank you? you, Mr. President. Goodbye. Goodbye. I hope that we can have one of our hunting trips soon. Yes, so do I. Goodbye, Francis. See you tomorrow. Goodbye, John. Hmm, nice. Ah, yeah, something smells good. What's that I smell? Uh, you know very well what you smell. You smell corned beef and cabbage. Oh, well, that's fine. <laughs> Just what I want for dinner tonight. Oh, but that isn't your dinner. That isn't my dinner? No. You know what the doctor said about your gout. What am I having? Cream chicken. Oh, well, who's having the corned beef and cabbage? Your servants. Well, you give the servants my dinner and give me their dinner. But your gout, dear, you... Oh, nonsense. The gout is just a state of mind. I'm not going to have gout. I'm going to have corned beef and cabbage. You'll be laid up again in the morning. Oh, no, I won't. You'll see. I, I won't have a sign of gout in the morning. There's no use carrying on like that. Oh, but my foot hurts so. Well, you would eat corned beef and cabbage. Why should corned beef and cabbage go to my foot? I'm sure I don't know. Uh, Francis, must you stamp around the room like that? Why, dear, I was moving very quiet. Every time you move, it goes right through my foot. Oh! You did not quietly. Oh, John, come on. Uh, but you'd better tiptoe. Oh, no, no, no. oh hello, John. I've come down with a bad case of corned beef and cabbage. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Mr. President. Oh, heavens, why don't I not quietly... I'll get it, dear. Oh, not a moment's peace this morning. Is the President in? Oh, there you are, Mr. President. Oh, it's you, Billy. You know John Wise, don't you? Yes, I know John Wise. Now, Mr. I... President, you promised us you would not interfere any further. Billy, 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 would you mind not shouting in the direction of my foot like that? It's throbbing so... You're I... making fools out of your entire party. It's impossible to work with you if you're going to keep doing things like this. Like what? Like interfering with appointments. Now, we have a good party man in Walkerton, and he's been promised the job of postmaster, and he's got to have it. Well, what's your objection to the man who's in? He's a member of the other party, and he's a menace to ours. Oh, now, wait a minute. A postmaster in the small town... This postmaster is a bad influence. He's a member of the opposition party, and he's an offensive partisan. He's continually talking against us. He's what? What did you say, Billy? I said he's continually talking against our party. He uses the post office as a headquarters. Well, that's what I thought you said. We can't have men in office who are trying to undermine our influence. Why, in the position of postmaster, he can talk to everyone in town. Uh-huh. Uh, Billy, have you ever met this man? Well, I... Have you ever met him? Well, I can't say that I've actually met him. Where did you get your information? From our man in Walkerton. But you never actually saw the present postmaster yourself. Well, no, but there are lots of postmasters in the United States that I haven't actually seen. Billy, this man is deaf and dumb. Uh, he's what? He's a deaf mute. Well, well, that's impossible. Well, it's true, Billy. That's why we gave him the position. And believe me, that's the only reason I've been trying to keep the position for him. Well, that's, uh, that's uh, a very strange yes, thing. Yes, Billy, uh... there are 2,000 post offices in Virginia. You may have 1,999 of them, but I want this one. Mr. President, I don't blame you. I'm glad I came here today, sir. I'm glad of this reminder of the dividing line where politics end and humanity takes over. <laughs> well, Billy, I'm so glad to hear you say that. 
I'm glad to know that beneath those politics there beats a heart that isn't completely stone. Oh, politicians have hearts, Mr. President. Oh, yes. But we can't wear them on our sleeves like the uh, chief executive can. Uh, 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 well, I see what you mean. <laughs> well, where is the port? Shall we uh, drink a toast to the postmaster of Walkerton, Mr. President? Port? Port with that foot? John, he can't. Oh, oh Francis, I forgot you were here. Well, gentlemen, you drink your toast in port to the president, to the postmaster, and the president of the United States will join you in a glass of water. Ah, my foot feels much better already. I'm happy today. Happy about the postmaster, happy to be president. And happy to have a wonderful wife and the most perfect child that was ever born to a completely unprejudiced father. <laughs> Well, you've probably figured out by now who I was when all that happened. It really did happen, you know. And you'll have the answer in just a moment. What's new in Filmland? Well, for one thing, this year's Academy Award winners have been chosen. The highly prized Oscars have been distributed to Sir Lawrence Olivier, Jane Wyman, Walter Houston, and other outstanding screen players. And here's some great news. The Luella Parsons Show on most of these ABC stations this Sunday night will feature Academy Award winners as guest stars. If you thrill to Olivier's great performance as the melancholy Dane in Hamlet and to Jane Wyman's thrilling portrayal of the deaf mute in Johnny Belinda, then we're certain you'll want to be listening tonight to meet Olivier and other great Academy Award winners on the Luella Parsons Show. And now, here again is Edward Arnold. <laughs> Well, good morning, Mr. President. Out walking your baby, I see. Yes, I see you're out with yours, too. How do you like the carriage? Oh, it couldn't be better. My, uh, uh, you know my baby's cutting her fifth tooth? Only her fifth? What tooth is yours on? Her sixth. Oh, well, you don't want them to be too toothy, you know. <laughs> uh, tell me, uh, what's your baby's name? Glorietta. Glorietta Mayflow Smith. Oh, Depressing, isn't it? But my wife liked it. What's yours name? Uh, Ruth. Well, let's introduce him. After all, someday Glorietta Mayflow will want to tell her friends that when she was a year old, she met the daughter of the President of the United States, Miss Ruth Cleveland. <laughs> Yes, it was Grover Cleveland who had such trouble with the office seekers and who intervened to save the job of the deaf-mute postmaster in Walkerton, Virginia, and who liked to exchange dinners with the servants when the servants had corned beef and cabbage. Be with us again next week for another exciting story that happened in Washington to Mr. President. Goodbye. Edward Arnold appeared by arrangement with Metro-Golden-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor picture Little Women, starring June Allison, Peter Lawford, Margaret O'Brien, and Elizabeth Taylor. Mr. President was created by Robert G. Jennings. It was produced and directed by Leonard Reed. This story by Gene Holloway was based on incidents in the life of President Grover Cleveland. Music was composed by Basil Adlam. Be sure to listen again next week when the American Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations bring you Edward Arnold with another interesting and factual story of Mr. President. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Basil Adlam did a lot of radio work. One of my favorites of his was the music that he did for uh, the Jimmy Stewart-helmed program, The Six Shooter. 
uh, from uh, 75 years ago, March 27th, 1949, Edward Arnold as Mr. President. Visit our webpage, classicradio.stream, to support the program. Uh, you can also stream our shows there on demand. You can learn about building a classic radio collection of your own. You can find our social media links there. And if you'd like to support the program, you can buy me a coffee or purchase a couple of the items that are listed there. That's at classicradio.stream. Coming up next, an episode of Theatre Royale starring Sir Lawrence Olivier. Survival in the nuclear age is your responsibility. Are you prepared? Tommy! Tommy, help me carry in these groceries. Oh, gosh, Mom, you're gonna have a party? Man, look at all that food. Hands off, young man. That's our two-week emergency food supply, and it's going right into the shelter. For two weeks following an enemy attack, you may have to survive without outside help. You'll be forced to depend on the supplies you have on hand. When buying for your emergency supply, choose foods that will provide a well-balanced diet. Be sure to include mostly canned and dried foods that can be eaten without cooking. Store at least seven gallons of water per person. Change the water every six weeks and rotate the food supply at least twice a year. Remember, a strong defense begins with a prepared family and ends with a protected nation. Be prepared. Store your emergency food and water supply in your home shelter today. I think it's safe to say that Harry Allen Towers was a prolific talent. He produced a lot of syndicated radio and television programs. Among those shows that we have aired here have been The Lives of Harry Lyme and The Black Museum with Orson Welles, The Secrets of Scotland Yard with Clive Brook, Horatio Hornblower uh, starring Michael Hordom, a series based on Sherlock Holmes, and uh, we also have the uh, episodes that we hear here, the uh, programs entitled Theater Royal. They were syndicated shows uh, through Harry Allen Towers, but they also aired NBC at a variety of times from October of 1953 to the beginning of September of 1954. And it, it was bounced all around the schedule. Uh, and you're going to hear today an episode from 70 years ago, March 27th, 1954. Sir Lawrence Olivier, uh, the host at this time, uh, it it was split. Uh, Sir Lawrence Olivier did a number of the shows, Sir Ralph Richardson, others. Uh, this episode featuring Sir Lawrence Olivier as host and star of A Tale of Two Cities. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company presents, transcribes, Sir Lawrence Olivier in Theatre Royal. This is Lawrence Olivier. We have before now turned to the novels of Charles Dickens and taken from them sequences as a basis for our radio play. Today's play comes from the same magnificent source. The setting is London and Paris at the time of the French Revolution. The book, A Tale of Two Cities. The sequences we've chosen will be familiar to you. And I myself shall be playing the role of Sidney Carton. strange face which makes two men so exactly alike that one may pass for the other, which throws those men together through love, then allows the death of one to buy the life of the other, as mine shall do tomorrow. When Sidney Carton dies, that Charles Darnay may live. How did it all begin? Those ten long years ago, that day in court, when I first saw Charles Darnay. Yes, when I first saw her. Poor Lucy. 
Poor dear, sweet girl. How she trembled for him even then. How obviously she loved him. How she feared for his life. For his life was at stake, that time no less than this. When fate first threw us together. When Charles Darnay was on trial for treason in London. Silence in court. Miss Manette, had you any conversation with the prisoner on your passage with him across the channel from France? Yes, sir. Recall it. When the gentleman came on board... Do you mean the prisoner? Yes, sir. Then say the prisoner. When the prisoner came on board, he noticed that my father was very ill and weak. He had been unjustly imprisoned in the Bastille in Paris for many years. Never mind about your father, Miss Manette. The prisoner... <coughs> he helped me to make up a bed for him on the deck and to shelter him from the weather. He was very kind to us. And I hope that I may not repay him by doing him harm today. Miss Manette, if the prisoner does not perfectly understand that you are merely giving evidence which you cannot escape from giving with great unwillingness, he is the only person present in that condition. Please go on. The charge on which Charles Darnay was appearing, treason and espionage, was obviously absurd. He was a Frenchman, yes, who had left his country and had settled in London for private family reasons. But as to his loyalty, there could be no possible doubt. The charges against him, in fact, were based upon the lying evidence of a professional spy and informer, one James Barsad, very well known to me. And as he gave his evidence, I slipped a note to my friend, the defending counsel. I saw the prisoner that very night in a tavern outside the dockyard at Chatham. Five years ago? Yes. He was sitting there in the bar talking secretly with two men I recognized as naval dockyard workers. And they gave him some papers. You say again that you are quite sure it was the prisoner. Oh, yes. Did you ever see anyone very like the prisoner? Oh, not so like that I could be mistaken, no. Then look very carefully at my learned friend here. And then look carefully at the prisoner. How say you? Are they very like each other? <laughs> We were like each other. So like that we might well have passed for twin brothers. And in that likeness, Charles Darnay found salvation. The case against him was dismissed. That night, at my invitation, we dined together in a tavern off Fleet Street. My counsel told me what you had done for me. How you called his attention to the extraordinary resemblance between us. How that fact alone broke down the charges against me. I can only thank you for that with all my heart, Mr. I neither want thanks nor merit any, Mr. Darnley. It was nothing in the first place. And I don't even know why I troubled to do it in the second. Mr. Darnley, let me ask you a question. You think I particularly like you? You have acted as if you do, but I don't think you do. <laughs> I don't think I do. I begin to have a good opinion of your understanding. Well, I hope there's nothing to prevent me calling the reckoning and our parting without ill blood on either oh, side. No. <laughs> nothing at all. Are you calling the whole reckoning? But of course. Mm. That is the least I can do. Uh -huh. After all, I probably owe you my life. Good. Then bring me another pint of this wine drawer. Then only... <laughs> Last word, Mr. Darnay. Huh? You think I'm drunk? I think you have been drinking, Mr. Cartoon. Think? You know I've been drinking. Very well, then. I know you have. Then you might as well know why. I'm a disappointed man, Mr. Darnay. I care for nobody on earth. And nobody cares for me. You might have used your talents better, Mr. Carton. Maybe so, Mr. Darnay. Maybe not. Good night. Good night, sir. And once again... Thank you for what you did. I never attempted to deceive myself. Danny had done me no ill, and only the one thing stood between us forever. It was he that Lucy Manette loved. 
It was not Sidney Carton. Even so, I must hear the truth from her own lips. I fear you are not well, Mr. Carton. No. But the life I lead is hardly conducive to health. Is it not a pity... Forgive me. But is it not a pity to lead no better life? God knows it's a shame. Then why not change it? It's too late for that. I shall never be better than I am. If it had been possible, Miss Manette, that you could have returned my love, such as I am. Monsieur. Ah, well, even then, I should probably have disgraced you and pulled you down. I know very well that you've no tenderness for me. I ask for none. I'm even grateful that you haven't. Can I not help you, Mr. Carton, even without it? Yes, if you'll hear me through, Miss Manette. I wish you to know that, having met you, you and your father has, well, stirred old shadows that I thought had died out in me. Within myself, I shall always worship you, no matter how I seem to behave. Will you believe that? Yes. It's useless to say it, I know, but it rises out of my soul. For you, and for anyone dear to you, I would do anything. I would give my life for you. Or to keep a life beside you that you loved. I had known it in my heart all along. When Lucy Manette married Charles Darnay, I was the first to wish them happiness. In that kind and friendly home of theirs, I was an irregular but always welcome guest. For that, no doubt, I had Lucy to thank. For Charles Darnay and I could never be really friendly no matter how much we seemed to resemble each other. Charles Darnay, Lucy Manette, and Dr. Manette, her father, all three of them were French. A French family living as émigrés in London, as there were soon to be thousands of such families. Émigrés, refugees from the terror. The terror of the French Revolution. Is the news from France so very grave, Mr. Lorry? Well, these last few weeks, the news has been almost too terrible to believe, my dear. Oh. And the tales we hear of life in that unhappy city, uh, I shall not frighten you with them. Paris was always an unhappy city, monsieur. It was an unhappy city for me when I was a prisoner in the Bastille, alone in a cell for 18 years, till my reason was all but gone. Father dear, we agreed never to talk about that. The storming of the Bastille, I can understand. The Bastille was notorious, the very symbol of oppression. But the stories one hears these last few months, the terror. Well, perhaps only the French can understand that. I doubt whether even they can understand it, Mr. Carton. Sometimes it seems as though a wave of madness sweeps over the world like an epidemic disease. Men lose their wits and lose their conscience. They act blindly as though their only motivation was hate against their kind. That is what happened in France today. The people of France have suffered bitterly. If they are filled with bitterness, we must not judge them too harshly, monsieur. Though you and I would die a thousand times before we would raise a hand in anger against even our oppressors. Mr. Lorry, I, I see that my poor father is tired and upset by the news. Would you excuse us if we retire? I have a headache myself. And... Lucy, my dear, please forgive me. I should have remembered how painful all this must be to the doctor. Oh, please sit down, Mr. Lorry. I know my husband has things to discuss with you. Good night. Good night, my dear. Good night, Mr. Carton. Good night, madam. Good night, gentlemen. Good night, monsieur. Sit down, Lorry. So the news from Paris is worse than ever. Much worse. As you know, the bank has a lot of interest over there, and perhaps the news reaches us quicker than anyone else in London. We've even begun to post notices of it in the bank's window. So I saw this afternoon. The notices look very grave. That is why I have decided to go to Paris myself. What, you? But surely... Oh, you mean I'm too old? No, no, I mean that the country is disorganized, and the journey may not even My be safe. My dear Charles, those are my very reasons for going. But as for it being safe, oh, it's safe enough for me. No real bother to interfere with an old fellow like me. There are far too many people better worth interfering with. They may not bother to make very careful inquiries, my dear sir. Charles here was arrested and put on trial for his life even here in London. They thought he was a spy, you may remember. 
When a city's as badly disorganized as Paris... If it weren't disorganized, my dear Carton, there'd be no reason for my going. As it is, we have important interests at stake there. I almost wish I were going myself in some ways. As a Frenchman born, I can't help thinking that it might be possible to preach a little reason, even to the mob. I was saying to Lucy only last I night... I wonder you dare mention her name. Wishing to go to France. Leave her here to die of worry. There's nobody left to worry about you, Mr. Lorry. Oh, nobody that's dependent on me, sir. Nor is there any cause for worry in my case. Oh, um, by the way, I wonder whether either of you can help me. This letter was brought into the bank today by our French courier, addressed to the Marquis saint evremond care of the bank. We, we've no known him at all. Do either of you happen to know him? The Marquis saint evremond Yes, I know him. If you leave it with me, I'll see that he receives it. Ah, thank you. It may well be important. Well, Charles, I'll be going. I must complete my packing for tomorrow. I shall be on my way to Paris. Good night, Mr. Carton. Good night, sir. You'll explain to the Marquis how the letter came into my hands, Charles. I will, rest assured. And bon voyage. <laughs> The Marquis saint Evremond received that letter. Indeed, he had received it already. For the Marquis saint Evremond was Charles Darnay himself. Within 24 hours of reading that letter, Charles Darnay had started on the journey to Paris himself, secretly, and leaving a note to Lucy and her father. He had gone in answer to a call of honor to try and save the life of his steward, the manager of his abandoned estates in France, now under arrest by the terror, held as a hostage for his master. And when that master arrived in Paris. Citizen Defarge, is this the emigre Evremonde? This is the man. Your age, Evremonde? 37. Married, Evremonde? Yes, in England. Ah, without a doubt. You are consigned, Evremonde, to the prison of La Force. But just heaven. Under what law? And for what offense? We have new laws, Evremonde, and new offenses since you were last year. I am here voluntarily in response to that appeal there by a fellow Frenchman. He is under arrest and has asked me to appear in his defense. You are an emigre. And emigres are forbidden to return to France on pain of death. You have read the decree. When was that decree passed? Two days ago. I was already in France two days ago. How could I possibly have known about it sooner? The penalty prescribed by the decree is death. I demand a fair hearing in court. It is my right. Emigres have no rights, Evremond. In a moment, we continue Theatre Royal with Sir Lawrence Olivier. I'd like to take this time to preview just a few of Sunday's wonderful shows for you here on NBC. There's distinguished Charles Munch conducting the NBC symphony in Claude Debussy's Iberia and Ravel's Le Tombeau de Cooper M. And the Marriotts, who try arranging a blind date for daughter Liz on the warmly human series The Marriage. While your NBC star playhouse brings you Joan Fontaine, in Flaubert's timeless Madame Bovary. Also, weekend, your Sunday newspaper of the air, collector's item, Sunday at home, meet the press, and, well, lots and lots more, and all good listening, too. So why not tune in yourself tomorrow to NBC? You'll see what we mean. But now we continue Theatre Royal with Sir Lawrence Olivier. Lucy and her father did not need to wait for the news of Charles Darnay's arrest. For as soon as they knew of his journey, they had set out after him for Paris. There they learned of his arrest beyond all shadow of doubt, for he lay at the mercy of the Revolutionary Tribunal. And it was a fearful place, the Paris of 1792. The rule of the terror which struck away all security of life and liberty. The prisons gorged with people who had committed no offense and could obtain no hearing. And overshadowing all the gaunt, insatiable spectre of the guillotine. Nuit de champagne. 
Envie de la République. Anne-Marie de la Rochelle, ennemie de la République. terrible bloodbath of those days, men and women whose only crime was noble birth were murdered by the thousands. Day after day they stood before their accusers, the dreaded revolutionary tribunal. Day after day they heard their sentences pronounced and day after day the tumbrils bore them out to the mob that surged about the guillotine. And in due course it was the turn of Charles Darnay, the one-time Marquis saint evremond You are charged with being an enemy of the Republic. If that be true, the sentence of this tribunal is death. Following day, Charles Darnay was condemned to death by the Revolutionary Tribunal for a crime committed some 30 years before by his father and his uncle. And against that sentence of death, there could be no appeal. <laughs> I had arrived in Paris myself the evening of Charles Darnay's rearrest. I knew in my heart that nothing now could save him, nothing short of a miracle. And then, perhaps, a miracle happened. In a wine shop near La Conciergerie, I made the acquaintance of his jailer, a turnkey from the prison. And this turnkey was very well known to me. So, Mr. James Barsad, professional spy and informer of London. You now have work over here in Paris as well. Mm. What's that to you, Mr. Carton? I'm no friend of yours. I propose to win your friendship, Mr. Turnkey Barsad. Mr. Lying, perjured, scoundrelly Barsad. <laughs> you need to have good cards for that. I have good cards, Mr. Turnkey, turncoat Barsad. You gave false evidence against a friend of mine at the Old Bailey some years ago. His name was Charles Darnay. You are now a turnkey in the conciergerie prison in Paris, and your prisoner, one of them, is that same Charles Darnay. I shall do nothing for him. In any case, by tomorrow he'll be dead under the guillotine. Oh, no, Mr. Barsad. That is not in the cards I hold. <laughs> what cards are they, Mr. Let me Carton? run them over for you. You've been a paid spy for the government in London, and you are here under a false name. That is a very good card. You are now in the employ of the French Revolutionary Government, who know far less about your spying activities in the past than I do. That is another good card. They might be persuaded, Mr. Barshad, that you are still in the pay of the British government, the aristocratic government of Pitt, the sworn foe of the revolution. That is a really excellent card, Mr. Barshad. It's a lie. I, I'm here for myself. I had to leave. I'm sure you did, Mr. Renegade Barshad. But now let me show you how I should play my cards. First, I should play this ace, denunciation to the nearest section committee. Would you really be able to convince them that you are not a spy for the British government any longer? Mr. Carton, in all justice... Justice, Mr. Barshad, for a perjured informer and a spy? What cards have you got in your hand? Take your time and have a good look. Hmm. Well, very well, Mr. Carton. What do you want me to do? Nothing very much, Mr. Barsad. Nothing will endanger your neck in any way. Um, something which will remove the danger from you forever. I told him what I had in mind and what he must do to help me. After all, there was only the one thing possible if Charles Darnay was to be saved. And that one thing I had already decided that I must do. Not for Donnie himself, perhaps, but for the woman that he'd married. Only this one night left. There was no time to be lost. Only one other man in Paris who could help me. Mr. Lorry, the banker. Don't ask me why I'm giving you these instructions, Mr. Lorry. I have a reason, a good one. I do not doubt it, Mr. Carter. Charles Donnie, there can be no further hope. We know that. I have reason to believe that Dr. Manette and Lucy are in very grave danger as well. 
and that they may be arrested after Danny has died. Therefore, they must at once leave Paris and get back to safety in England. I had you already see. intended to take them back with me, Mr. Ah, Carter. Uh, yes, but you must do so tomorrow. Your preparations have already been made, I know. Huh? Early tomorrow, have your horses ready so that you may start at two in the afternoon. Charles Danny is due to die yeah. at three, Mr. Carter. Yes, yes. It is imperative that Dr. Manette and Lucy should leave the city before that. It is imperative, Mr. Lorry. You will also reserve a place for me in your coat. I should be glad to do that, Mr. Carter. You have your papers for traveling. So has Dr. Manette and his daughter. You see, these are my papers, made out for Sidney Carton, an Englishman. Take these papers and keep them for me. Bring them to the coach tomorrow. But Mr. Carton... No, 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 do that for me, Mr. Lorry. I have obtained permission to pay one last visit to Darnie at the prison tomorrow at noon. You, you have? But, but, but how? I uh, was told... That... Never mind how. You must persuade Lucy to leave in the coach with you tomorrow at two o'clock precisely. Mm -hmm. You must tell her that her father is in danger. Never mind herself. She will probably wish to die with her husband. Tell her that she must leave Paris with you. That it is her husband's dying wish. Mm -hmm. Tell her that more depends on it than she dare believe or hope. Tell the same thing to her father. You must make them do as I say. I think I can do that, Mr. Carton. Ah, I thought so. Quietly and steadily have all arrangements made in the courtyard here, even to taking your own seat in the carriage. The moment I come and join you, take me in and drive away. I understand that I wait for you under all circumstances. You have my traveling papers here with the rest and have promised to reserve my place. Wait for nothing but to have my place occupied. And then for England. Your place occupied? Yes. Very well, Mr. Carton. And now, promise me solemnly that nothing will influence you to alter the course we have agreed upon. I promise you, Mr. Carton. Remember those words tomorrow. Change the course or delay it in any way for any reason. And no life can possibly be saved and many lives must inevitably be sacrificed. I will remember. I shall do my part faithfully. I hope to do mine no less. Goodbye, Mr. Lorry. Goodbye, Mr. Carton. <laughs> Only one purchase to be made at the apothecaries. One last night to spend in that seething, turbulent city that knew no mercy and lived only by hate. And then on the morrow, at one o'clock in the afternoon. Carton! What on earth? <laughs> of all people upon earth, you least expected to see me. I can hmm? scarcely believe it. You're not a prisoner, too. No. I happen to have influence with one of the turnkeys here. He let me visit you. I come from your wife, dear Darnie, with a request from her. What is it? A most earnest, pressing, and emphatic entreaty. Addressed to you in the most pathetic tones of the voice so dear to you. Yes. You have no time to ask me why I bring it or what it means. I have no time to tell you. You must simply do as I say. Take off those boots you're wearing and but, put on these of mine. No, yes, no, but quickly, quickly, quickly. quickly. Captain, there is no escape here from this place. It can't be done. You'll only die with me. It, it's madness. It's asking you to escape. Change that cravat for this of mine. But, and your coat. Oh, Carton, dear Carton, I tell you it's madness. I implore you not to add your death to mine. The coat, man, quickly. I have no time to explain. Nobody can escape from here. It's always failed. <sighs> Neither either. Goodbye, Charles. I'm sorry I had to do that. Bassett. See, the wonderful resemblance, just like it was that time with the old Bailey. Hmm? You've nothing to fear. I'll soon be out of harm's way. Get assistance and take me to the coach. Take you, Mr. Carter? Yes, him, you fool, him. He was weak and faint when you brought him in. The parting was too much for him. He's fainted. These things happen. Quick, call your assistance. You swear you won't betray me? Take him what I told you. Put him in the coach that is waiting. You'll soon have nothing further to fear. There is nothing left but the ending. May it not be unworthy of one who aspired to love her. May the lives for which I lay down my life be peaceful, useful, prosperous and happy in the England that I shall see no more. May this beautiful city and brilliant people 
rise from the abyss once more, and in their struggles to be truly free, wear out the evil of this time. Citizen Evremond called Darnay, your hour has come. Follow me. I am ready. It is a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. And the ending was cut off, but what can I say? Uh, from March 27, 1954, 70 years ago today, Theater Royal, starring Sir Lawrence Olivier, here on Classic Radio Theater, with Wyatt Cox tomorrow, X-1, The Lives of Harry Lime, Jack Benny, Gangbusters, and The Adventures of Jungle Jim. But coming up next, we'll see what's going on in Pine Ridge with Lum and Abner. Information could be your lifeline to survival during enemy attack. Are you prepared? Four whole days. How much longer can it rain like this? Oh, Bill, is there any news? I don't know. The road's washed out. I couldn't get to town. Uh, phone working yet? No, neither is the radio. If only we knew whether the dam's going to hold. Hey, how about that battery-operated radio of mine in the den? I'll bet that's still working. Radio has always been a source of quick information during a disaster. However, in case of attack, radio's beams could help guide enemy planes to their target. That's the reason Conelrad, the emergency system of broadcasting, was devised. When you hear the alert signal, tune to these Conelrad frequencies, 640 and 1240, on your regular radio. During a national emergency, all power lines may be cut off. To make sure you receive the necessary information and instructions, keep a battery-operated radio in your family shelter. For survival information, know these frequencies, 640 and 1240, on your standard radio. It is vital, even in these days, that you have a battery-powered radio. The Internet might not be your friend, so make sure you have a battery-powered radio. Now, let's head back 82 years to March 27, 1942, to Pine Ridge, Arkansas, and see what's going on in the lives of Lum and Abner. The makers of Alka-Seltzer bring you Lum and Abner. Well, sir, folks, there are going to be some big doings down in Pine Ridge this Saturday night. The Pine Ridge Silver Cornet Band is holding a benefit dance to raise money for the community's USO fund. And say, are you planning big doings of your own sometime this weekend? If you are, may we suggest that you check up on your supply of Alka-Seltzer tablets before your good time starts. With Alka-Seltzer handy... Quick relief for those after-the-party ailments can be yours if you should have too good a time. You'll really be surprised at how quickly Alka-Seltzer can help you set right with the world again. For when you take Alka-Seltzer, it eases that dull headache and settles an upset sour stomach in a hurry. So remember, if your plans call for big times this weekend, check up on your supply of Alka-Seltzer tablets right away. Then, if you're running short, be sure to get yourself another package of these modern effervescent tablets before your fun begins. You may need Alka-Seltzer after it's all over. And now, let's see what's going on down in Pine Ridge. 
Well, Lum and Cedric are still missing, and no one has been able to dig up any clues that might shed light on this mystery. Mr. Fremont, the detective on the case, thought he was hot on Lum's trail yesterday when he overheard a phone conversation in which Abner was talking about hiding somebody in the barn loft. However, this turned out to be nothing more than a dog that belonged to Abner's daughter, Little Pearl. As we look in on the little community today, we find Squire Skimp in the Jotham Down store. Mousy Gray has just entered. Listen. Well, howdy, Mousy. Come in, come in. Howdy, Squire. Wonderful world. Yes, wonderful world, Mousy. Yes, uh, anything I can do for you. Well, no, sir, I'm just looking for Mr. Fremont. Have you seen him? Well, no. Uh, well, that is not today. I'm sure he's still in town, though. Well, I guess I'd better be going then. I thought sure I'd find him here at the store. No, I'm the only one here, Mousy. I'm taking care of things while Abner's off on some wild goose chase up in the hills. Up in the hills? Has he disappeared, too? No, uh, he just went up there to look for Lum. Uh, he has some harebrained idea that Lum is hiding in one of those old caves on Piney Mountain, which, of course, is ridiculous. My guess is that Lum's a lot farther away from Pine Ridge than that by now. Yes, sir. Well, I guess I'd better be going. If you see Mr. Fremont, why, well, tell him that I want to see him. Yes, all right, Mousy. Uh, what shall I tell him that it's about? Oh, uh... Just say that Operator XW-9 is ready. Operator XW... Well, what's the meaning of that, Mousy? Well, I'll see you later, Squire. Oh, well, now, wait. Uh, come back here, Mousy. Wonderful world, Squire. Yes, yes, wonderful world. Hmm. Operator XW-9. Uh, what in the world can that boy be up to? Hmm. Hello, Squire Skimp's office, insurance, bonds, and real estate. I mean, uh, jot them down, store. I, I beg your pardon. Oh, hello, Caleb. Uh, no, no, Abner isn't back yet. Yeah, well, now, if he finds out anything about Cedric or Lum, well, I'll have him call you. You saw who? Oh, Mousy, yes. Wearing a mustache. Well, I do know. Uh, just a minute, Caleb. I see someone coming in the store. Oh, oh it's, uh, it's Mr. Fremont. I, I better hang up, Caleb. But now, if I hear anything, I'll let you know. All right, Caleb. Uh, not at all, not at all. Goodbye. Mm. Well, howdy, Mr. Fremont. Come in, sir. Come oh, in. Hello, Mr. Skip. Where's Peabody today? Is he in? Why, no. Uh, he went up... Well, I swan to goodness, Mr. Fremont, what's happened to you? Oh, uh, you mean these scratches on my face? Yes. <laughs> That's only half of it. You should see me in a bathing suit. Well, uh, what happened, Mr. Fremont? Well, I'm not sure. All I know is that it's part of some diabolical plan Peabody has cooked up to get rid of me. Well. Last night he gave me some hot tips where Edwards might be hiding. Well, I followed them. And look at me now. Well, I don't believe I quite understand, Mr. Fremont. Uh, whereabouts did Abner send you? Well, one of the places was a farm just north of town where there's a bunch of uh, big fenced-in cages or something in the back. Uh, cages? Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, it must be the Macmillan place, yes. The uh, Macmillan boys are great hunters. They're always bringing back wildcats or something to keep most cages. Wildcats? Yes, sir. Is that what they were? I could have sworn they were tigers or lions. Why, well, I thought I'd never get out of there alive. Mm. Man, those things nearly scratched me to pieces. Yes, well, I must have a little talk with Abner. He shouldn't resort to such tricks. Well, I'm awful sorry to hear this, Mr. Fremont. I'm afraid that Abner is a trifle, well, uh, impulsive. Mm. Well, whatever it is, I wish he'd stop it. I don't know why he can't understand that he's only doing Edwards a lot of harm by keeping him hid this way. The longer Edward stays away, the tougher it's going to be on both of them. Yeah, but by George, I, I can't convince Peabody of that. Yes, well, I think it is all due to a strong sense of loyalty that Abner holds for Lum. Yes, but he's not helping him this way. He he's not being logical. No, but, uh, <laughs> well, uh, you find, Mr. Fremont, that uh, Abner's actions are governed by his heart, not his head. Mm -hmm. Well... This can't go on much longer. 
Oh, uh, where did you say Peabody had gone? Why, uh, he went up into the mountain someplace to hunt for Lum. To hunt for him? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, don't give me that. Peabody knows where his partner is. No, no, I'm positive that he doesn't, Mr. Freeman. Oh, come now, Mr. Skimp. You're old enough to know better than to act this way. I tell you, it's for Edward's own good that we find him. Yes, yes, sir, I know that. But I'm sorry I can't help you, Mr. Fremont. Well, of course, now, I have a few theories that oh, I'd be glad... Oh, theories, theories. You're as bad as everyone else in this town. Well, just a matter of time before we catch up with Edwards. And when we do, well, I'd hate to be in his shoes. Oh, yes, yes, it's a shame that he'd done this. It certainly is. Uh, by the way, Mr. Fremont, uh, young Mousy Gray was looking for you. Who was? Uh, Mousy Gray. Uh, I believe he referred to himself as Operator XW9. Oh. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, is uh, young Mousy uh, working for you, Mr. Fremont? Well, I guess I'd better be running along, Mr. Skimp. If anything turns up, let me know. Yes, yes, all right. I'll be glad to do it. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Fremont. I believe there comes Abner now. Oh, good. good. Yes, I, I know you want to stay and see him. Yes, yes, of course. It's about time I had a showdown with him. Well, howdy, Abner. Have any luck on your trip? Hi, doggy squire. I looked all over. Well, hello, Mr. Fremont. I never know you still here. Oh, you're not rid of me yet, Mr. Peabody. I may be around here a long time, unless you decide to get sensible and start talking. Well, now, I've told you all I'm going to tell you. If you never found Lum in none of them places I told you about, why... Hi, doggies. <laughs> What's the matter with your face? I can't imagine. <laughs> now, look, Peabody, why don't you and I stop playing games? Games? We ain't playing no games. Well, of course, now, if you're any good at checkers, I'll get the board out. I'm and... not talking about checkers. Well, I don't believe I know no other game. Wait a minute, wait a minute. There comes Mousy Gray on there. Reckon what he wants, he quit the store here once. Well, I believe he has a new job now, uh, doesn't he, Mr. Fremont? I don't know. Does he? Well, howdy, Mousy. Come on in. Doggies, you're welcome here any time. Well, thank you, Abner. Oh, hello, Mr. Fremont. I've been looking for you. Oh, you have? Well, fine. Well, could I talk to you now? Well, yes, certainly. Alone? Alone? What do you want to see him alone for, Mousy? Uh, come along, Abner. Uh, I guess you and I'd better step out of the store for a few minutes and uh, let these gentlemen do their talking in private. Come along now. Well, now, here, Squat. Come along, Abner. Well, all right. Doggies, every time something secret comes up around here, I always have to get out of the way. All right. We're alone now, Mr. Gray. What have you found out? Well, you promised if I'd help you, why, you'd call me Operator XW9. Okay. Operator XW9, then. I'll call you anything you like. You're the only person in this whole town I've found who's willing to help me. Well, sir, I've always wanted to be a detective, Mr. Fremont. Well, that's fine. Now, what have you found out? Well, I have it all written down here. I made out a sort of a report for good, you. Good, good. Let's have it. I like to be systematic about everything, don't you, Mr. Fremont? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, what information have you got? If you're systematic, you get more accomplished in the shorter time, I always say. Yeah, that's the right idea. Well, what have you accomplished so far? Anything definite? Oh, yes, sir. It's all definite. Do you want to hear it? Of course, of course. Uh... I knew if I'd get a local man to help me out accomplish something. Go ahead. Read it. All right, sir. Uh, report of Operator XW9. Mm -hmm. Hours on duty, 14. Time out for meals, 2 hours and 5 minutes. Now, look, look. I don't care about that. Get to the important stuff. Yes, sir. Building shattered. Cedric's house. Cedric's garage. Lum's house. Lum store. Ray guns. I'm not interested in that. What did you find out? Well, sir, I'm coming to that. Disguise is worn while on duty. Black mustache, red mustache and red wig, red wig and black mustache, gray beard and red mustache. Good grief, man. You're driving me crazy. What have you found out about where Edwards is hiding? That's what I told you to get. Yes, sir. Well, that comes next here. Uh, information on Lum's hiding place. Yeah? 
secret operator XW9 reports herewith to date that Lum Edwards' escaped criminal is definitely not hiding at home. He is not hiding at the store. I know that. He is not hiding at Cedric Weehunt's. He is not hiding at Abner Peabody's. I know all the places where he isn't hiding. Mr. Gray, what I want to know is where is he hiding? Well, sir, now, that's something that I've been unable to get any information on at all. That's the only little detail that I haven't been able to work out for you, Mr. Fremont. Say, folks, when you buy vitamins, you should know exactly what you get for your money. And now that there are two kinds of one-a-day brand vitamin tablets, the A and D tablets and the B complex tablets, you ought to know what each of these two different tablets contains. Now, first, one-a-day vitamin A and D tablets. Well, friends, each tablet is as rich in vitamins A and D as one and a half teaspoonfuls of United States Pharmacopeia Minimum Cod Liver Oil. Now, that means 5,000 units of vitamin A and 500 units of vitamin D, or 25% more than your basic normal daily needs. So, to meet these normal requirements, just one tablet a day is all you need, and one tablet a day is all you take. Now, remember, that's one-a-day brand vitamin A and D tablets. And now, for one-a-day brand vitamin B complex tablets, the same brand name, the same one-a-day convenience, but an entirely different group of vitamins. The B vitamins, which are also essential to your bodily well-being. Now, each tablet contains 333 United States Pharmacopeia units of vitamin B1, 2,000 micrograms of vitamin B2, 10 milligrams of nicotinamide, and 250 micrograms of vitamin B6. So, when you buy vitamins A and D and B complex, ask your druggist for both one-a-day vitamin A and D tablets in the yellow box and one-a-day vitamin B complex tablets in the gray box. Be sure to look for that big one on each package. So it's clear that we know where Lum is not. The question is, where is Lum? I think we may know the answer to that coming up soon. All right, uh, that episode of Lum and Abner, originally broadcast March 27, 1942, 82 years ago today. Hope your Wednesday's been great, and hope your Thursday's even better. Visit our webpage, classicradio.stream, and listen tomorrow for X-1, The Lives of Harry Lime, Jack Benny, Gangbusters, and The Adventures of Jungle Jim. Have yourself a great day, and we will talk to you on Thursday. I'm Wyatt Cox.